I fell in love with the ocean 10 years ago. Oh, sorry, when I was a child. I was 10 years old, living in rural Canada, and my parents put my brother and I into our family station wagon, and we drove the 24 hours down to the coast of Florida. When we arrived and I saw the ocean for the first time, I saw its vastness. We opened the car door and I smelt the salty sea air. And when we went wading into the waves, we saw the dolphins playing offshore. I knew then and there that I wanted to look after all the creatures that lived in the oceans. A decade later, I was an undergraduate major studying in marine biology. And what I learned is that if I wanted to look after all those plants and animals, I first had to look after their home the ocean itself. Now, I'm an oceanographer, and I study the health of our oceans. And what I'm seeing in my research and the research of my colleagues is not great. The oceans aren't doing very well, and that's because of carbon. The carbon that we're putting in the atmosphere that's warming the seawater temperatures, and then some of that carbon is dissolving into the seawater, changing the seawater pH. Now, the oceans are really old. They're over four billion years. And they've been evolving for a very long period of time over the entire time they've been around. And if we look at the things that lived in the ocean a long time ago, they look very different than what lives in the ocean today. But what's happening now is the rate of change that's happening, the warming and the change in seawater pH, is happening faster than it's happened over the past several hundred million years, and maybe faster than it's ever happened. And so we're changing what's going to be able to live in the oceans. And in particular, we're making it hard for organisms that have a calcium carbonate skeleton. So if you're a scuba diver or a snorkeler, then maybe tropical corals are a familiar sight to you. Or maybe you don't like going in the ocean water, but you like eating stuff from the ocean. Shellfish and oysters, these have a calcium carbonate skeleton, and it's harder for them to grow in the oceans today because of us. And then as a scientist, what I study, it's a plant. It's this like pink thing that you can see. It's a plant living in the shallow waters of the ocean on the seafloor. It photosynthesizes, and it grows a hard rock-like skeleton. And this plant is amazing because we can use it as a tool to understand how the oceans have changed. To explain this, I'm going to use a plant that probably most of you are more familiar with, a tree. So some trees in some locations form growth rings. And these growth rings are formed every year in the trunk of the tree. And if you know when the trunk was cut down or um, if you take a piece of the tree, you can actually identify time in the growth of the trunk. And you can count year after year after year that that tree was living. Now, some trees in some locations, they respond to changes in temperature. When it's warmer, they grow more. And that growth ring is actually a little bit wider. And when it's cooler outside, a cooler year, they grow less. And that growth ring is a little bit narrower. And you can actually measure the width of each of these growth rings that that tree was living and create a record of how temperature around that tree has changed over the lifespan of the tree. And I do the same thing in the oceans with my coral and algae. The top layer across the pink there was the living tissue layer when the specimen was collected. This is one of our giant specimens. You can see it was about this big when we collected it. And it formed this hard rock-like skeleton of calcium carbonate. And when we section this algae in half, we get growth layers in the skeleton, just like the growth rings in a tree. And growth in this algae changes, but what else changes in the skeleton is the concentration of an element, magnesium. So that when the seawater around the algae is growing, is when the seawater is higher, you get more magnesium. And when the seawater is colder, you get less magnesium. So you can actually measure the amount of magnesium in each growth layer of the skeleton over the time the algae was growing, and you have a thermometer of seawater temperature creating a record of how the temperatures have changed. So if this algae lived for 10 years, we know what temperature was in the oceans a decade ago. Or if the algae lived for 100 years, then we know what temperature was in the oceans a century ago. But what's really neat is this algae can grow for more than six times longer than any of us in this room. We have a specimen that's 646 years old from the Northern Atlantic Ocean, each year putting down that growth layer and capturing seawater temperature in its skeleton. And what we're finding from these records of ocean temperature is that temperature has gone up over the past century from the oceans, from these coral and algae, from trees on land and other materials on our planet, we know temperature has gone up about one degree Celsius. 
And based on our understanding of what causes temperature changing and how those variables are changing, we know that temperature is going to go up another degree Celsius by the end of this century. And that is because of carbon. What we're doing is we are burning fossil fuels. We're taking carbon that's locked in the fossil fuel reservoir, for example, is coal. We're combusting it for energy. And as a product of that, we're putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Through the greenhouse gas effect, that's warming our planet and our oceans. But the other thing that's happening is about a third of that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that we're putting in the carbon into the atmosphere is dissolving into the ocean. And this is causing a change in the chemistry of the ocean. The change that's happening is when you put more carbon dioxide dissolving into seawater, it increases the amount of the hydrogen ion. We're increasing hydrogen concentration in the seawater. And if you remember, maybe from high school chemistry or middle school chemistry, that's pH. pH is a measure of the hydrogen ion. We have decreased the pH of our global oceans by 0.1 pH units over the past several decades. Now, 0.1 doesn't seem like very much, but that's actually a logarithmic scale. And we've increased the relative acidity of the oceans by 25%. Now, what happens when you decrease seawater pH, when you increase the amount of the hydrogen ion, is more chemical reactions that decreases the amount of the carbonate ion. And it's that carbonate ion that the tropical corals, the shellfish, and my coral and algae use to grow their carbonate skeleton. Their calcium carbonate skeleton needs that carbonate ion, and we're taking away that carbonate ion from the seawater in our oceans. So my research project right now as a scientist is to try and understand what will our oceans look like in the future. One way we can understand that is to go to areas where this is happening faster. This is a map of the amount of the carbonate ion in our oceans. And what you can see where the red colors are, there's less carbonate ion in the higher latitudes around the Southern Ocean, around Antarctica, and in the Arctic. There's less carbonate here because the water is colder and it's dissolving more carbon dioxide. So we can use it as a canary in the gold mine, a testing bed, to see what the future oceans are going to look like. I was fortunate a couple of years ago to go up to northern Canada, above the Arctic Circle, to do some research in a very small community. We went up there. It was about a week after the longest day of the year, but it was still winter. And here I am standing on top of several hundred meters of ocean. I'm standing on about a meter of sea ice. It was starting to melt. And if I had come back a couple weeks later, then I pr probably would have been swimming in the ocean at that point. We went during the day searching for the algae. We had identified ahead of time, based on the geology of the area, locations where we thought we would find the algae underneath the water. Now, it's cold. I'm a scuba diver, but I'm a bit of a wuss. So we worked with experienced ice diver. We actually had to cut a hole in the ice for him to go underwater with the idea to go find the algae so that we can bring it back to the lab to study the skeleton of the algae. When he went down, because sunlight can penetrate through sea ice, this was the visibility he had. You can see the rocky sea floor and some of the fleshy green algae. And there, for the first time at this site, on the large rocks, we found my algae. Now, this was early July, and there was still sea ice. So this plant that can grow for 650 years can do so under sea ice 10 months of the year. So from this collection, we brought it back to the lab. And now we're analyzing the skeleton to see how has temperature changed in the past at this location in the Arctic? How has seawater pH changed? And how is the properties of the skeleton? How is this algae doing? Is the skeleton more fragile? Is it more robust? How is it doing, how is the health of this environment for these organisms that live there? I don't have the answers yet. This is still a project that we're working on. But I do know what's happening is that we're changing our environment. Because of our carbon dioxide emissions, we are causing a warming, and we are causing seawater pH to decline. Now, the good news to the story, if there is good news, is that we know what the problem is. It's carbon. But that also means we can do something about it. We can decide to shape the future of our oceans and of our planet to make sure that they're a healthy home for everything that lives in it, like my coral and algae, and all the things that depend on it, like us. So even though it's a vast problem, much vaster than the ocean is itself, I know that by reducing my own carbon dioxide emissions, I can make a difference.
So every time I ride my bike instead of take my car. Or instead of flying far away, but stay close to home for a staycation. Or even instead of just following Meatless Monday, but also having more beans and lentils on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday as well, I reduce my carbon dioxide emissions. The other thing I can do is that when I exercise my right to vote, I take into account the health of our oceans and our planet when I make that decision. Because if we all do this, the small things and the big things, we can change what our future planet is going to look like. We can reduce our carbon dioxide emissions, and by the end of this century, instead of warming three, four, five degrees Celsius, we will only warm one degree. And instead of decreasing the seawater pH by about half a pH unit, we can only decrease it a little bit more than it already has gone down. And this means that our ocean that supports all these things, both that live in it and that depend on it, things like my algae that have been around for 650 years, well, maybe it'll be around for 650 more. Thank you.